Okay. Um, welcome everyone. Let's get started. Um, after this, we have a break, so let's finish this quickly. So we're going to talk about end-to-end uh, -end processing of telemetry events, um, 3.7 million per second using Lambda architecture. Myself is Saurabh. I'm a solution architect with Autonomous Professional Services, and my and with me I have Raghav. Hi, I'm Raghav. I'm the Cloud Data Service Architect at Semantic and part of Cloud Platform Engineering Group. So, few facts about Semantic. <coughs> Semantic is a global leader in cybersecurity, and we have like thousands of customers who's using the products, threat protection and uh, data loss prevention. And uh, we are part of Cloud Platform Engineering Group. We do evaluate technologies and then provide like uh, a platform like batch processing, stream processing platform for the semantic product teams to leverage and also accelerate their development in terms of new generation technologies. So the agenda is uh, we'll be talking about security data like at global scale and infrastructure at scale and telemetry data processing architecture, uh, tunable targets, performance benchmarks and how we do the service monitoring. So security data lake at global scale. So this is the high level uh, uh, architecture like in terms of how we collect the data. So we, we collect the data from telemetry uh, uh, like the devices running on the customer sites and that data is transferred to the uh, Kafka queue. And from the Kafka what we do is we, we take it from the storm processing and then it writes to two different, uh, 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 two different places where we do the real time through Elasticsearch and HPS and the high streaming through the Hive uh, tables. And the Hive streaming and the query processing over there will be used by the research and security analysis to do the some, uh, to analyze some of the threat patterns or data patterns in terms of security data. And the real time is mostly feeded to the product uh, teams which is provided to the end customers. And all of, the, all of this uh, are running on the uh, YAN based and there are a lot of other analytics applications that is running on HDFS. Uh, and this is running on physical machines, uh, private cloud and public cloud. So in terms of uh, Lambda architecture, how we map uh, the three different layers is like the speed, speed layer is mapped to the uh, Elasticsearch and HBase technology and the serving layer is mapped to the uh, Spark and Hive streaming, whereas the batch layer is mostly like the map reduce or Spark regular Spark on uh, the regular Spark jobs. So. The idea is like for the speed layer, what we do is we create a low latency, we give like say like 30 days of data that is all real time in data so the product teams can leverage any kind of threat that's coming in real time data. Whereas the batch layer, what it does is it'll run all its batch jobs which providing uh, uh, arbitrary views and that views will be moved to the serving layer which would be queried by like security analysts and also it could be queried by the real time data product teams as well. The, uh, the point here is the complexity isolation <coughs> Once data makes to the serving layer via batch, then split layer can be neglected at some times. Moving to infrastructure at scale, um, so we run hybrid data lake. We run across three different uh, uh, environments. One is our private cloud, which is on OpenStack. It serves as a dev, dev and QA environment with 350 nodes. We have bare metal deployment across multiple data centers. Uh, that is our production environment. It runs on 600 nodes. Uh, we have public cloud as well, which is Amazon right now, which runs on 200 nodes. We use Ambari uh, for deploying a Hortonox data platform on all these three environments. We use uh, Ironic and Ansible to deploy on bare metal, and we use CloudBreak to deploy on our cloud environments, which is public and private. We also have centralized logging and metering services, which monitors all the logs collected in different uh, jobs as well as services. And metering is basically, uh, which Raghav is going to talk more about, is about to collect all the different metrics which we need for evaluation. We run a scalable and SLA based service, which basically, if you can see, our job failure rate is very less as compared to the job completed. Right? We have 25K Hive tables. We have 306 databases. We have Storm in production with 50 plus topologies running in parallel and those are all telemetry topologies. We have Kafka in production as well. We have Edgebase and Elasticsearch. Now let's talk about the telemetry data processing architecture. So as Raga mentioned, uh, the telemetry events are collected from different telemetry data collectors, which are then pushed to a telemetry gateway, which is hosted inside our multiple data centers. And then we consume from there raw events into RabbitMQ. 
Once the data is in RabbitMQ, we run our identity topology, which attaches the schema to those events um, and then push to a centralized bus, which is Kafka. From Kafka, we start consuming it into different topologies, the first topology being transformation topology. We use opaque Trident Kafka Spout to consume it in micro batches and to implement exactly one semantic. And from there, the deserialized objects goes to transformation functions. We apply different transformation function based on the IDC data type. From there, the events again flow back to Kafka as objects. From Kafka, we start consuming it into Hive uh, using Hive ingestion topology, which is basically a Hive streaming Trident topology, which writes it to, to directly Hive table, and that is then available in real time for users to query using Spark context of Hive and directly Hive on Thes. From Kafka, again the same Kafka, we send the events to Elasticsearch as well as, well as Edgebase. So this gives us the feed which we need for the real time for the products to gain intelligence on. They, we have two real time implementation because sometimes users just want to uh, see the raw event and index in an index format and just query them. Whereas um, in Edgebase, some, sometimes users or the products wants to use Phoenix on top of Edgebase to be able to use JDBC as well as the SQL. Moving to tunable targets. So uh, tunable targets, we will uh, show some of the configurations for the different services and also some of the values defined for it. So consider like the tunable targets is like a, a it, it depends on your workload and also the service that you're running with specific version as well as what are what kind of resources that you have. So tunable target is something that it's tun tuning itself is like optimizing itself is like a moving target. So this is something like as a what we have done so far with getting that uh, uh, performance. So so to begin with, uh, we use CentOS 7 and uh, some of the things that common uh, configurations that we define for CentOS 7 is disable transparent huge pages, disable swap, and uh, configure VM cache flushing, and IO scheduler specifically for if you are using SSDs. So we use like deadline and uh, JPOD ext4 and network we use like dual bond at 10 Gbps with those configurations. Yeah. So for Kafka, uh, there are three different uh, places where you could actually tune, like broker, producer, and consumer. So on the right-hand side, we have the uh, resources that we use for physical machine and what kind of instance type we use it in AWS and uh, what kind of version of Kafka that we are using for this specific configurations. So uh, the first three is like mostly related to the socket.send buffer and uh, receive buffer. It's mostly related to the TCP uh, buffer. That gives you like, you need to calculate the bandwidth delay product, uh, which is the uh, uh, maximum uh, uh, networking interface card that you have times the uh, 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 round, round trip time. So that is the calculation that you could get it with the TCP buffer size that you want to set it up. And number of network threads, we, we set it to the number of CPU cores that we have. And the number of IO threads, we set it according to the number of disks, physical disks, that you have it in a sp uh, one single instance. And also consider like a Zookeeper connection timeout and session, session timeout. That depends on your round trip and how, uh, 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 based on other workloads of Zookeeper itself. Uh, in terms of producer, like uh, if you consider like if you want to tune uh, producer, there are two things that we need to consider: the latency and throughput. Uh, in terms of latency, if you're writing like single message every for every send, you're writing only one message, then you would have like a low latency, but your throughput will be less. So to consider like if you want a more throughput with a, a little bit of higher latency, then what you could do is like you could actually batch the messages and uh, send it at once. And buffer dot memory is the amount of memory that needs to be uh, 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 required for ba batching. And also linger dot ms is like uh, it's a kind of like when actually the producer when it actually have that batch size it immediately sends it out. So the linger dot ms actually provides a kind of a small delay so that if there is any messages that can be accumulated within that period it can accumulate and send it at once. And also consider like compression because especially compression will help in terms of like, uh, because compression works on the batching size, so if you are doing the batching, that means your compression can help much more higher throughput. And socket.send buffer, which is similar to the uh, TCP uh, uh, buffer. And consumer, uh, there are some configurations which is for the older version, Kafka, uh, Kafka consumers, there are two different consumers right now. 
and uh, uh, Kafka works with backward compatibility. So the uh, number of consumer dot fetches is like how many number of threads that you need to fetch from that specific partition. So we generally keep it for the number of uh, 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 from the topic. Sorry. So we generally keep it. Uh, the number of partitions on a given topic, that's the number of consumer fetcher threads that we keep, and the TCP buffer window, and the maximum message size that you can fetch. So that is something uh, important to maximize the consumer performance and the minimum bytes. That is every request that you send it to a Kafka broker, what is the minimum number of bytes that the fetch request has to be sent. So this, like, if there is not enough amount of data that has been uh, uh, available to send it, the thread will be waiting on the request. So make sure that you also set that according to your workload. Moving to Storm, uh, we started with Nimbus. We configured Nimbus high availability with four, bro four Nimbus servers running in parallel. Uh, we avoided downtime and performance degradation by doing that. We also implemented uh, uh, or we used the Zookeeper, uh, uh, we reduced the workload of Zookeeper and uh, on the Storm as well. Uh, the so topology submission time significantly reduced after we switched to HDFS code distributed. We set the minimum replication count for topology uh, to be three, which is basically a floor of number of Nimbus servers divided by two plus one. We set the maxim maximum replication time to be minus one, which is unlimited. We set the code synchronous frequency second to be two minutes, which is basically the amount of time Storm Nimbus takes to sync the code from the code distributed path to its local. We set the netty buffer size, we increased it from default to 10 MB. We set the numbers, number of threads for Nimbus, thrift threads to be to 56. Moving to supervisors. We use supervisor D to control our supervisors. Supervisor slots, we determined by using this formula. That is minimum of number of hyperthreaded cores uh, or the total number of, mem uh, the total amount of memory available on the server divided by total memory used by power workers. We set the uh, supervisor child ops to be 4 GB, uh, both minimum heap and the maximum heap. And also we logged GC and monitored GC as well. For the workers, um, so the basically the rule of thumb for workers was use case of Storm. Our use case of Storm was telemetry processing, right? The telemetry processing was divided into two, transformation topology as well as ingestion topology. So for transformation, it was CPU bond. So for CPU bond process, uh, spout or bolt, we used uh, one executor per worker. Whereas for the IO bond, uh, which was ingestion topology, we set eight executors per worker. We fixed the JVM memory for the worker, which was based out upon, upon our heaps, uh, heap size of Kafka to handle the large messages fetch. Along with that, it was the split size of the bolt. So we set it to eight GB, minimum and maximum gain. And we configured the parameters uh, for the concrete mark sweep uh, so that we can control our GC cycles uh, and can guarantee that you know, the JVM pauses don't happen on the workers. We also log GC and monitor GC very closely. For the topologies, we set these parameters. Uh, we set the topology dot optimize, which is, was a new feature in Storm, to true. We set the message timeout to be higher because we don't wanted uh, uh, we wanted exactly one semantic. Right? So we don't wanted our workers to stop processing if the message timeout happens more frequently. We set the max spout pending to be three because we are using Trident. Uh, the guideline says one to five, three worked out good for us. We removed uh, the consumer register because um, there was a bug in Ambari which caused it to degrade performance of this specific version of Storm. We set the incoming uh, queue and the outgoing queue, batch sizes as well as the queue sizes. Uh, the default is eight and eight. We increased it to 64 and 16 and found that that's better for our performance. We increased the Executor receive buffer bytes as well as the send buffer size uh, to 32K each. Also for topologies, parallelism, uh, we identified that the, the right number of parallelism was determined using this formula. The number of workers per node uh, in the cluster multiplied by the minus by the ACAT tasks. We consumed 200 MB in one go because of, of micro batch implementation. We consumed 200 MB at one go and we processed that uh, unless we again go and fetch the next offset range. We set the minimum fetch size also to 100 MB, which is a patch and in consumer uh, and is coming soon in Storm 1.0. Zookeeper. Okay. Uh, for the Zookeeper, uh, mostly it's related to the GC uh, and also like uh, it's better to keep your data directory and the transaction log directory separate in a physical, uh, separate physically uh, uh, separated disk. 
And also consider like for Zookeeper, <clears throat> if you are having like multiple services using the same quorum, uh, at least we have seen some of the issues that Zookeeper is bottleneck, where like uh, uh, Storm, HBase, Kafka, and HA quorum all sharing the same Zookeeper quorum. So we have separated it out and we saw some performance improvements. And that's the GC configurations for Zookeeper. For Elasticsearch, uh, uh, ours is like more of a, a heavy indexing. And for the Elasticsearch, uh, Bootstrap, MLock, all is like the AS will not swap memory. And index, uh, indices.fielddata.cache size is 25%. With the latest version of Elasticsearch, like 2.0, by default, it's set to doc values. Doc values will give you better performance, with, uh, but that has to be done during the indexing uh, index creation. Threadpool.bulk.q thread size, uh, I believe it's by default it's 1,000, but we set it to 5,000. Uh, if you don't set it to a, a number that's being used for your indexing purpose, then you might see like some of the uh, documents might be uh, 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 lost due to the rejected, yes, rejected exception. Since we are using it through Storm, so we don't see it, but we identify those values through Storm itself, since Storm is at least once guaranteed processing. And index.refresh interval, so we set it to 30 seconds. So this particular configuration is like the, 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 the time you write the data to Elasticsearch and the time it actually appears for the search query itself. So depending on your workload, you can set this time and as well as like depending on your SLA itself, at what time, at what, what is the time between you write and what is the time between that you can query the data itself. And index.memory.index buffer size, we set it to 10%, uh, which will uh, give us like better performance. You can actually uh, increase it depending on your memory um, uh, resources available. And also the store.type mmap uh, file system, memory map file system, which will uh, give optimization on the OS cache. The GC settings uh, from the Elasticsearch community or like from the Elasticsearch, they say that they need not use G1 GCs. So we are using G1 GC with this settings and uh, particularly uh, consider like anything behind like uh, uh, anything after like 1.8.45 GVM. So G1 GC is giving us better performance and we don't see like a, 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 a any like a full GC or something. And also like if you're doing a heavy indexing, uh, use the bulk APIs and for uh, Aggregations like Kibana or anything like that, you can actually use the client node, which will do some of the, which will take some of the offload from the data nodes and do the aggregations on the client side. For HBase, uh, uh, we have like heavy indexing on writes and reads, and for the HBase, this is on the left. You have the GC configuration, what we do, and that's the snapshot of the configurations on the right from the Ambari, uh, uh, that's running in production. And we, if you see there, like you have 25% and 25% set to uh, uh, read and write uh, buffers. That's for the mem store uh, flush. So those are the snapshots for the HBS configurations. Moving to Hive. Um, so we identified a couple of tuning targets again. Uh, the first one was stable structure, right? So our telemetry data has a lot of binary field. When we started implementing uh, the solution, we started using binary data type in Hive. With, with ORC, which caused a lot of performance issues. So and the queries which was coming on that table was coming we usually string. So we converted that data type to binary. We also use integer fields. This two, uh, uh, two tunables came out of a lot of testing. We did five queries, uh, five of our top five critical queries on different table structures, and the results are on the top. Moving to partition budgeting scheme. So our data we used to come daily. So we used to partition, we are partitioning by date timestamp. But there were some requirement where they wanted additional partitioning. When we evaluated additional partitioning, it was just not worth it. It was resulting into large explosion of number of partitions and small file issues and inefficient ORC compression. For bucketing, we did evaluate each table for the right bucketing column. But what was the thumb rule was if two tables are bucketed on the same column, then use the same number of buckets in two tables. Right. For sorting, each table was again evaluated for the right column for which you, when you insert only, you sort. Right. So that helped us optimize. The thumb rule again was if the table is bucketed, the bucketed column is typically the first column to be sorted. Coming to ORC tuning, um, so the three previous tuning, table structure, bucketing, partitioning, sorting, that impacted our ORC performance the max. Right. We defaulted the ORC strip size to be 128 MB, which was balanced for both insert as well as queries. We use ZLIP compression because 
as smaller as your data set goes, the queries are faster. We use predicate pushdown. Other than that, some of the ORC parameters are on the left, which we evaluated. We increased the indexes from default to 64K. We saw that if you index large stripes together, the query performance improves. We also set our Bloom filter on a specific column, which was file SHA2. That was our maximum uh, queried column. Moving to Hive streaming, right? Uh, so the two tuning targets for Hive streaming, we use Trident API. We experimented with Core Storm API as well. So the two tuning targets, we are Metastore stability, as well as our batch size, evaluate the batch size and the transaction batch size using Hive streaming. So the first thing which we did, we disabled Hive shell across our clusters. Nobody could do Hive enter and run queries. Everybody has to use Hive Beeline, which helped us in security as well as reduced our workload on Metastore. So our Metastore can be used for Hive streaming. We configured five Metastores for doing the compactions, which basically takes care of the minor and major compaction. And we did configure five specifically for streaming, and we used them as a connection pool. We set 16 GB as the heap size minimum and maximum for Hive. Uh, and we, uh, we tuned a hell lot of MySQL, which will be too much for this session. But uh, that improved our Metastore database scalability. Uh, we received the maximum EPS by keep increasing the batch size, but keep the transactions per batch as smaller. Right? For a single thread uh, Hive streaming, we were able to maximum hit uh, uh, 200K events per second for a single thread. Moving to performance benchmarks. So uh, with performance benchmarks, we ran a set of uh, tools uh, uh, from Kafka producer, consumer throughput test, uh, Storm Core and Trident topologies, the standard platform test suite, and uh, Hive TPC. For the Kafka itself, like uh, uh, there is a tool that's part of the Kafka itself to run the performance benchmarks, uh, performance test. So this is the set of uh, uh, producer and consumer and the message size that we ran. And the average uh, telemetry event size for 1,000 bytes was good in terms of um, uh, ingesting from 10 telemetry data sources in parallel. We have like somewhere around about 3.5 million messages for a single threaded sync asynchronous uh, 3x replication. So this uh, is, was like the first performance test that we ran on our uh, kind of like without the workload. And those are the different types of tests, like single threaded, no replication. Uh, async 3x three, three replication, each of them have a different uh, characteristics. So uh, that's from the Kafka producer and consumer tests. From, for a storm topology, uh, we used our own uh, uh, telemetry ingestion topologies, like the Trident, HDFS, uh, Hive telemetry, HBase, and Elasticsearch. All this has the bolts that's being writing to Elasticsearch, Hive streaming, using Hive streaming, and HBase and HDFS. Uh, these are the numbers. Uh, it might not be that visible, but we pretty much got around like 3.5 and above, uh, uh, 3.5 million and above for bare metal, and for AWS somewhere around uh, two, around 2.25 or something, around 2.25 million per second. Moving to a standard platform bench, um, so we wanted every component in our stack to scale. So we ran uh, different tests. Uh, we created a benchmark suite, which is uh, going to be open sourced again. Uh, we ran a Terrasort benchmark on different workloads. We ran random writer. We ran uh, DS DFS IO, uh, an end bench to monitor our name node performance, and MR bench along with Terrasort to monitor MapReduce performance. We did also ran data load, upload, and download speed on two different uh, environments, bare metal as well as Amazon EC2. We ran TPC DS also on 20 terabyte workload. Basically, it's a decision support performance benchmark, which resembles our data mart design as well. So we had EDW dimension model, and it has large fact tables and complex queries. We ran the performance test again on two environments. All our queries were successful uh, using high one phase uh, on both the environments, bare metal and Amazon. Coming to service monitoring. So in order to find out like if you want to optimize any applications or any kind of tuning or you need to identify any bottlenecks in our applications, you need a platform where you can actually validate your, uh, where you can actually get your metrics and find out like if you are continuously doing it uh, on an incremental basis on a different configuration parameters, right? So what we did was we built like a service monitoring uh, application which is like collecting the logs, central logs and collecting the metrics. 
and that itself we actually providing it as a service to our uh, semantic product teams to leverage and this is not just for the platform teams to leverage it's also for the our product teams to leverage so the architecture behind this is uh, uh, it's the same set of technologies so what we do is we use kafka upstream uh, elastic search influx db and open tsdb and we use the like kibana and grafana and the other set of services that we use is like the archival uh, alerting service quota service and uh, tenant management so this one is like we uh, the logstash logstash is something like we pretty commonly use it to send metrics to kafka uh, logstash collect d and stats d so what we do is using this architecture we actually was able to collect all the metrics of the different performance tunings and for the platform team itself and also for the application teams uh, yeah this is a snapshot of a kafka monitoring dashboard that we built using grafana and if you look at it here right like whenever we are running some performance test we identify how many messages we get per second incoming rate in bytes and outgoing rates in byte and also like the leader count the leader count and part if the leader count is not well balanced between the kafka nodes then one of the broker is getting heavy load in terms of read and write so similarly you have to make sure that whenever you are doing or whenever you are monitoring any application you need to make sure that leader count is well balanced similarly the partition count also like if one broker gets all of the partitions like most of the partitions then it's going to get more uh, performance bottleneck in terms of uh, uh, providing the service and also like whenever a kafka node goes down for any reason like if there is a disk failure or something then the under under replicated partition count will go up so you need to make sure that the under replicated partition comes back to a regular the normal uh, replicated uh, numbers Uh, these are the different uh, and also like leader election rate those are like very small but it's it's good to know like what is going on in your cluster for any for a given service and this is for the elastic search similarly we have like a, a very long list of uh, configurations that are defined for elastic search so this is a very high level snapshot of what elastic search itself like number of nodes what is the relocating shards and if there is a relo if there is an initialization shard that got stuck then we need to identify if that shard has to be uh, rebalanced or has to be uh, restarted if the elastic search service itself and also we identify the key uh, cache field data size itself uh, this one is more uh, like we built uh, uh, using our applications like uh, when storm is reading from kafka we need to identify if there is any sp specific bottleneck in a specific partition and if kafka if, if you are getting writes into kafka from the producer side we need to see where the storm is lagging like how far it is lagging in terms of reading that partitions so if you see on the right hand side like for each partitions like somewhere we have around eight or nine partitions i believe so you know no i think uh, we have around like 20 partitions so each of those partitions have like the numbers that shows how much the storm is lagging behind the actual producing uh, producer that's writing the data into kafka so this this gives us like if storm is lagging or kafka is producing too much of data or anything that we can actually correlate between the previous pre previous dashboard and the storm kafka lag dashboard so this is the log collection like we also identify if there is any issues in the logs so generally like if you are running in a distributed systems you cannot just log into every single system and identify if there is some issues with the logs so you need to have like some kind of centralized uh, logging service so for that what we used is the same architecture that we showed previously where through kibana we identify we get all the logs from each of the systems like storm kafka hdfs everywhere and we identify if there is any issues going on in that service so that's the logging service that we have so that comes to the end of the session uh, thank you very much for attending now we can accept the questions So um, Elasticsearch and Edgebase, why, right, together? Uh, so there are some product team which needs uh, to see the raw event directly and uh, in an index format, and they don't don't want any conversion to happen. But whereas there are some product team as well which want to do some simple ag aggregations or algorithms and then see the data. So that's why uh, when through a query engine or a JDBC. So that's why Edgebase. Sorry. Did you deploy Kafka on AWS? Yeah, yeah. What was the deployment structure? 
uh, across AZ, so one AZ. So we have uh, multiple regions, as you can imagine, multiple data centers also, like uh, uh, different uh, time zones. And uh, so we deployed, uh, so we have a couple of systems in Belt right now, which is, uh, uh, we have a, let me say this, okay. <laughs> so we have a, yeah. it's something like, you know, we have a bus, you can imagine. Uh, it uh, replicates and mirrors uh, from one Kafka region to another Kafka region. Uh, we use Kafka mirroring a lot to do that. And then from there, uh, we uh, localize the data ingestion to each Kafka bus. Across AZ is like if you, I'm not sure if the recent version of Kafka has any kind of like rack awareness or AZ kind of awareness of uh, distributing the partitions to a specific AZs. Yeah, so what? Oh, okay. So what we would be doing is like in terms of we, when we actually uh, bring up the Kafka nodes, we bring up according to the AZs, but the partition itself can be manually reassigned to a specific node using the Kafka. Kafka has a reassigned partition tool. Using that, you can actually re reassign it to a different set of uh, nodes where you can actually define what AZs you need. I think you said your, 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 no, your production has 600 nodes. How many of those are dedicated to ingestion? Ingestion? Yeah. In the sense, which type of ingestion? Uh, I, your diagram has different parts. So I think different ingestion points. I guess the, the initial ingestion is where you, we're coming in from the... So that's a sum total of every nodes which we have in production in each data center. And we have like 80 nodes of Kafka as a sum total. And then again, we have multiple small buses sitting in different regions of Amazon. And again, the local data centers also. So we have five plus data centers in OpenStack as well, where the Kafka sits locally. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk about the parameters of the uh, streaming ingest tables in Hive? Like how many transactions you match, how many events per transaction? So the so the, be the best uh, numbers which we got for a single threaded process was uh, 200K transactions per batch for a batch size of 100. 200,000 transactions per batch? Yeah, 200K. Yeah. We didn't use Spark streaming. Uh, we tested with it, and it was not suiting our workload at that point. So with the Spark version at that point. So, so Storm, we are using actually we are using Storm from past three years now, two yeah. or three years yeah. right now. So so at that time, like Spark streaming or Flink or there was no one else in the streaming world. Like, right now, there are a lot of people, but we haven't moved it. Like that's yeah. how we are using, and we are seeing pretty stable in Storm. Six months. In the fine tuning, uh, from Hortonworks, like everybody, from engineering team, <laughs> and from Semantic, uh, 20 plus members. Yeah. It, it actually, it's not about the team size. It's actually who's who's the uh, responsible for particular service, right? Like if uh, not all the team members will be responsible for all the services. Like there were like set of engineers who are actually working on specific service. They go very deep into that and understand what's going on in tunnels of that. So that's how we do that. Like it's like batch by batch. Like you tune one with Storm, then go back to Elasticsearch, tune there. It's not like one single flow itself. You'll get the whole better performance. And the number of events per second was uh, tuned from uh, the source, which was RabbitMQ for us, to the point where the user can do select count star on the table directly and see that, okay, we are getting 3.7 million or not. Any thoughts on the ER for Kafka? So, the Kafka cluster, you know, dependencies there by default, one node can go down, can take care of. Let's talk about the whole cluster going down. I have a consumer reading the specific offset. There maybe can be used to replicate the data, but the offset won't be in place. So, any thoughts around that like, uh, ER for Kafka? Good question. We're waiting for next version of Kafka. Yeah, so uh, that make that will make Mirror Maker a little bit faster as well. And uh, uh, right now we had bottlenecks with Mirror Maker also. So, so we are waiting for so that. As well as, uh, yeah, we have a backup uh, pipeline as well every time. 
So, so, so you, there is a tool called Mirror Maker, yeah, so yeah. which you can run it like to replicate the data across data centers. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Are your HPA table and the not the records are not in the records? in HBase, uh, uh, there is no key. Like uh, we ingest directly raw events for the raw telemetry presence the raw, there. What's the raw key for the Sorry. Raw key. Are the raw keys not in? Yeah. So it's time series kind of database where we just insert the events as they come in. Sorry? So yeah, they are sorted. They are sorted on file chart too. That's our main column, yeah. Right, but then how do you scan it? How do you? Scan the record? We use Phoenix. Right, but you can scan. Do you scan the record? Yeah. We use Phoenix to basically query. Right, but we saw this. Like, you have all the records are in the partition. Yeah, we use secondary indexes if that's your question for Phoenix. We use Phoenix and secondary index. We build secondary index on those tables using Phoenix. Okay. Yeah. So the Phoenix table, you create the HBase table first, or you create the HBase table through Phoenix? HBase table through Phoenix. Okay. Our end, so main use case for HBase was not to store it just like that, for users to be able to use it through Phoenix JDBC and Query Engine. So that's why we created Phoenix table, and then we create, we update the secondary index as and when our data flows. What's the time table how do you get the It's 60 days. Of table, I don't know the exact size. I can get back to you on that question, but it's like 60 days for each telemetry data source. Yeah, yeah. 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 As well, yeah. So we run it on two data centers, um, bare metal as well as AWS. HBS has a lot of tuning parameters, and we see like sometimes region servers going down due to high GC pauses. Uh, that's where like we had some optimal GC configurations for HBase, and also like in terms of mem store, uh, we did a lot of experiments with HBase. Uh, first of all, that you know we started with uh, uh, tuning our mem store f uh, size, and then the flush ratios for uh, and the buffer ratios for read and write as well. So we started with uh, default 4040 for read and write, then we went down to 25. We increased the buffer write to be 40 at one time. Uh, but the maximum optimal performance were 25-25 for read and write buffer, if that's what your question was. It does take some effort to do it, yeah. keep it stable and running it. And we have Hortonworks committers, so <laughs> it's easy sometimes. How many hosts? How many hosts? Everything. Your entire topology. 3.7 million per second. 200 storm nodes. 200 storm nodes and 80 Kafka nodes. Yeah. If your use case matches and your hardware matches. Yeah. So we use, we use top of the line hardware. If you see in the hardware, if we, when I went through, we don't use anything which is cheap. We use D2 ATX large, we use I2 ATX large, we use R3 ATX large, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Hive RAM? It's not, the, not Hive RAM. It's basically the servers which is running Hive Metastore as well as Hive servers. We we didn't want it to end up like name node where you keep on increasing heap, right. and then at some point you start, you know, losing uh, the power of the machine. Right. So our hardware architecture is like that that we shared services, we um, have shared masters as well as shared slaves. Right. Yeah. Just uh, they're both. Some use cases we have SSDs. Some use cases we have spindles. Like so edge base is SSDs. Kafka is spindle, data nodes are spindle. Zuki for elastic search is SSDs. Yeah. Okay, secondary index is created through uh, Phoenix or is it going directly on the uh, Through Phoenix. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's good. Yeah. <laughs> issues, yes. So we didn't include the issue slide, else that will be <laughs> another session. 20, 30 minutes, just uh, one component. What version is this? Phoenix is 1.2. Uh, sorry, Phoenix is 0.5 something. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, four point something. I think yeah. it's part of HDP yeah. 2.3. So we're using HDP 2.3.2, so that simplifies. So the Shibana dashboard for components like you have, the graph, which shows number of parties changing parts, number of parties changing parts, right? So yeah. Is it easy to count of number of parties to distribution across the node? Do you do it by size also? So there's a possibility that one topic partitions can be smaller in size versus even though the distribution will look even, but the Partition size can be different, and it may appear that the distribution is the even. So for that, for that, right, you need to, uh, in terms of like Kafka's retention itself, how much data it can retain for a uh, for a given period of time. So that is something that you can define, and also the number of disks that you have, the size of the disk itself. If you have like say four terabytes disk, and you have like ten partitions sitting on that, and you're expecting like seven days or like two terabytes for the whole thing, then it will get definitely get filled up, right? So based on that, you actually linearly scale or you re reassign your partitions to your different nodes. So you can compute elasticity such that you have monitoring on different aspects. So looking at a graph is one thing. Nobody's watching it, looking at graphs. Oh, there are huge TVs. People are watching it. <laughs> so you have alerts also from people yeah. watching it. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So the alerts is on the real time. Um, uh, it's actually real, uh, the alerts is set on the actual pipeline when we write the metrics, when we write the logs. So we have like an open source project called Hendrix. So you can, uh, Hendrix, Hendrix. So you can take a look at its semantic GitHub. So that's something that we use for our thing. And, and it's integrated with PagerDuty, so everybody gets a call. It's, so if it's something with bad PagerDuty. happens in that graphs. Yeah, we have integration with PagerDuty, Slack. Is this a real-time system for running 24 by 7? Yes. Yeah. Sorry? What happens if it switch there? What, what kind of switch, like? Anyone, anything in that, in that stack. I mean, like, do you have two of everything? Like, yeah. What do you, okay, see so if we have, we have active, active cluster, you can say, pretty much. And both are running in parallel in every, um, in every production from it, like EC2, as well as, okay, yeah, a, yeah. Two, two data centers in each zone, you can, so each so type. Some yes. of the services does not have like rack awareness like Kafka, at least until the version that we are using. Again, but we, that we actually we manually say that where the partitions has to land in terms of like identifying which nodes are in the specific rack and then rack, putting it manual rack awareness kind of things. But like, yeah, we have some data like between different data centers as well. How are the data replicated? That's through the data pipes. So we have built like a data pipes where we collect data from one one instances, one one data center and move it to another data center from another data center to another. We built like, uh, it's after the Kafka. Yeah. No, so we have like two different Kafkas running on two different data centers. You can imagine every component in that architecture is two. So, so, so producer itself like, so there are different set of applications running on different uh, uh, geographically. So not every producers will be sending it to the same Kafka endpoint. They will be sending it to their own data centers where they are geographically located. So that geographically located data will be replicated across different data centers for high availability in terms of like data loss. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, based on the, it depends on the telemetry source. If the source is near to that region, it pushes there. Thank you. We are up. <laughs>